All right, in chapter one, I want to talk about light and color. Um, I think it's important that we cover the basics of how light and color work before we actually step into any 3D application. Um, it's important to know how it works so that we can make important decisions like uh, where to place the light or what color it should be. So I kind of just want to go over the basics. All right, so light. Um, light is important because, well, obviously we need it to see anything but with light, um, we can tell what color something is. We can tell uh, what shape something is, how far away something is. Well, that's pretty important. So what is light? Um, to keep it simple, let's just think of light as uh, lines of energy. So all light travels in a, well, for the most part, light travels in a straight line. Um, and I know that's a pretty simple um, explanation of what light is. It gets a lot more complicated than that. But for the purposes of this, let's just think of light as uh, lines of energy. Okay, so light has two main properties, reflection and refraction. And in this image we can see kind of both effects happening. We can see the reflection of these trees on the water and we can also see um, kind of that refraction happening of where we can see through the water. So if we were to think of uh, this line as the surface of that water, as light comes in contact with it, um, it's just reflected and bounced off. And similarly, um, if we think of refraction, the, w the light kind of just passes through. So that's kind of how refraction works. Um, and back to this image, um, there's a lot more reflection happening than we think. Um, everything in this image is reflecting light into our eyes. Uh, we don't see any light sources. We know that the sun is lighting everything, but the sun is not in the image. so. Um, we're seeing the sun's reflected light in this image. Now if we were to think of uh, these stones as being reflective, uh, we would have to zoom in microscopically to the surface and it would probably look something like this or it wouldn't be very flat at all. So as the light comes in contact, um, those rays that are bouncing off are very scattered and that's the reason why we can't see a reflection of ourselves in the stone is because we don't see a perfect uh, reflection. Um, this the ceiling on this um, image is very reflective. Um, it, this is this is basically a reflection of this sign. Um, this is all there's there, there's a little bit of light spilling onto it, but for the most part, this is a reflection. And we can see that um, kind of right here. We see just a very faint reflection of all the light sources. Um, light also um, can carry color information as it reflects. So as the light kind of comes in and hits this orange surface, it is reflecting some of that color, that orange color onto the back of this tennis ball. So we can kind of see some of that orange light um, down here. And that's very important uh, when you want to recreate a scene in 3D. Um, bounced light is, helps with that believability. Um, these gumballs have reflective uh, surfaces and we can see some of the reflection right here. But also we see these very hot, uh, white hot spots, and these are this is known as uh, specular highlights. Um, in 3D programs like Maya, um, they'll kind of just fake this effect, and they'll just kind of paint it onto the surfaces. So and they do this so that they don't have to accurately calculate um, reflections. But these white hot spots are just reflections of the light source. Uh, back to this image, um, there's another effect, a uh, surface effect um, called the Fresnel, and it's kind of like a facing ratio effect. So we can see that um, it is more reflective back here than it is over here, um, and that's because of that angle at which the light bounces off this water. So the angle is very wide back here, so we get more of a reflection. And as that angle starts to become more narrow, we begin to lose that reflection, and we can see through the water. Um, all right, so in this image, we can see some of that refraction happening where the light is passing through an object, and in this case, the water and the glass. So we can kind of see through um, through that and see um, past it. Um, with this leaf, we can see that the light is kind of passing through, but we can't see a clear image like we could with the water. And that's because um, the light rays that are coming out are more scattered, so we can't see a clear image of that. Um, another effect known as uh, subsurface scattering where light kind of comes through an object but instead of passing through it and leaving it kind of bounces around so the light kind of comes in 
uh, makes its way around this candle and then finally leaves down here. Um, and you can see that how the light kind of just dissipates. And here's another example. Um, jade uh, has a real subsurface scattering effect. Um, light comes in, bounces around, and, and then leaves. And here's one more example. Uh, we can see the light kind of passing through these grapes, and we can even see these grapes back here where they're receiving some of that light that has already been passed through, so it's, light is passing through more than one object in this image. All right, shadows. Um, shadows are a pretty important part to lighting. You want to be aware of not only where you have light, but where you don't have light. So in this image, we can see a pretty simple setup of just a wall, a floor, and a potted plant. But with shadows, we can create a more interesting image. Um, take note of the soft shadowing that we have from the sunlight. In the real world, um, lights never produce a hard shadow, and the reason is because they have a surface area. And somewhere like in computer graphics, where you can have an infinitely small point light, that's the only way you can produce a hard, um, crisp shadow. So uh, some shadows may look crisp, but they really have a soft edge. So keep that in mind when you're creating shadows. Um, in this image, we can see how the shadowing uh, is kind of used as a design device to give a more interesting look to an image. With this image, you can tell that the light source is pretty close because of the angle of the shadows from one another. Um, they're not really parallel, so we can tell that the light is pretty close to the, the objects, whereas in this image, we can tell that the light is further away because of the how parallel the shadows are. And and you want to keep that in mind when you want to kind of fake lighting or shadows. Um, you want to make sure that the shadows match the distance of, of the light source. This image, take note of how soft the shadows are the further away you get from the cup. But as you get closer, um, we get a little bit more crisp shadow. Uh, keep that in mind when, um, when, you want, when you're choosing the kind of shadows that you want. Um, you want to use a more physically accurate kind of shadow uh, for something like this. Whereas if the light source was uh, straight above it and we would have kind of a circular shadow all the way around, then we, we would want to use a less uh, ex less expensive light. Um, we can fake uh, and get away with a lot more um, fake faking with that kind of shadow. Uh, in this image, uh, look at how there's no sunlight, yet we still have some of this soft shadowing. And the reason is because the sky itself emits light. And in the computer graphics uh, world, we kind of call that, let me just zoom in here. We call that an ambient occlusion shadow, which is just a soft shadowing from the skylight. So you can see how everything's kind of got a soft shadow all the way around and underneath. All right, in this image, we can kind of see both kinds of shadow. We have that hard shadow from the sunlight, and we have um, those soft uh, gradient occlusion shadows uh, underneath. And the reason is because we have light from the sun and we also have light coming from the sky. Color. All right, color is pretty important to lighting, especially in artistic sense. It's so important that um, some studios will create color scripts to make sure that they have that continuity of color from one shot to the next inside a sequence. Um, it's important to be familiar with the color wheel so you can choose um, some good color palettes. Um, some artists, like painters, will kind of create a uh, section off the color wheel to create a color gamut to help them choose what colors to use and what colors not to use. Um, here's a, some, a few more examples of that color gamut. Um, and you can have different kinds of, of styles. Uh, the color temperature scale is also important because um, when a light gets more intense it doesn't just change in in value, it changes in color as well. So the more intense um, a light is will depend on what kind of color it is. And here's another example of that, how we can see the sunrise um, kind of reflects that color um, temperature scale. So if I turn it on, we can see that it matches up almost exactly to um, that scale. Right, in this image, we can we see some candlelight, and we can tell that um, they're pretty low intensity because of that scale. They're pretty low on the scale. And if I were to pull up this kind of color picker, we can see that um, as I choose the hottest point of the candle, we're more in the white area, but we start to go down in value, and then we start to go down in hue. So the color starts to change as we go down in temperature. So we can tell them in these other parts of the candle. 
Artificial lighting tends to be more in the upper half of that scale, so we'll have more blues and greens when we're creating a more artificial lighting scheme. Um, you can tell like in movies like The Matrix where a lot of the shots are real blue or real green because they want to kind of give you that artificial feel to it. Alright, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, shading and the different parts of light and shadow. So we can use a ball to kind of easily represent um, the different parts. So first we have the core light, which is just the side of the object which is emitted by the light. Um, then we have our opposite side, which is the core shadow. And so we have our two halves, and then that line in the middle is known as the terminator, where we kind of have that little gradation from the white, I mean, from the lit side to the uh, shadowed side. Then we have our highlight, which is kind of that reflected um, spot where it's reflecting the light. So in this case, we're reflecting the sunlight. Then we have our cast shadow, which is kind of on, which is on the ground, and that's just um, what's how where the ball is blocking that light, obviously. Then we have our uh, occlusion shadow, which is um, kind of as we get kind of tight in there, we start to lose a lot of that light, and it starts to get pure black in there, and that's where there's almost no light in there. And then we have our reflected light, where we have a little bit of um, subtle green in here, and we've got some of that blue from the uh, from the skylight. And here we can see um, kind of the same thing. Um, we've got our occlusion shadow, and we've got our two halves of the light. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, environment and atmosphere. So in this image we can see um, how back here the image is real um, uh, further away and we can tell because of kind of the color. If we kind of match the color of the trees back here to something like over here, we can tell that the colors are real more saturated over here than back here. And that's because of um, we're actually looking through the air particles. So we're seeing air particles um, which give us that faded look. So understanding this um, will help us in our 3D renders to give our images more depth and we can kind of um, replicate this look. And kind of the same thing where we have light and shadow kind of coming through and that atmosphere will let us kind of see that shape of, of, a, of that shadow. Alright, so there are different kind of camera effects that happen um, that I want to talk about. For instance, uh, in this image um, we see how the white light coming from this window is so bright that uh, it kind of spills over and creates this bloom effect and that's a camera effect that happens and I like to use this effect in my renderings because it kind of tends to make it look like the render is taken from a single camera and kind of ties everything together. Also take note of the nice color usage, how they kind of use a good uh, color palette from red and blues um, opposites to kind of create a nice composition. Um, depth of field, um, it's good to use depth of field in your renderings because it helps um, your audience's attention kind of focus on what you want them to focus on. So in this image, um, we kind of tend to keep our attention on this area. And even though we have this, um, it's kind of blurred out, so we're really focused in on this area. Um, de uh, depth blur is not a normal blur. It's it's kind of got different properties, um, a lens blur. So uh, Normally you would think of it as a Gaussian blur, but it's really not. This is kind of like what a Gaussian blur would look like. It would kind of just kind of evenly um, fade everything with each other, but lens blurs kind of um, act differently than that. So keep it, keep that in mind when you're using the different kinds of blurs. All right, so I think I've covered um, just about everything that I wanted to talk about before we get into my... Um, we've, we've talked about shadows, lights, colors, um, shading. So I think we've covered just about everything that I want to talk about, so let's go ahead and get started in Maya.